So uh, let's do that. <laughs> You're my first uh, American guest, Douglas, so welcome. Thank you. Hopefully I am not the last. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you didn't listen to my English right now before we begin this interview. <laughs> so maybe you are the last or maybe you are the last listener of this podcast or viewer of the video. <laughs> no, no. I, I look forward to sharing it and I think your English is uh, very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. I prepared my best French for you, Douglas. <laughs> I'll have to get my daughter or wife if you're going to speak French. They speak French, but I don't. Okay, so welcome to Le Board. So this is a French podcast and a French series of videos that I do with the people in my network. And uh, we have 30 minute conversation about business, of course. Uh, with C-suite leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, makers, doers, whatever, people who want to be um, leading their companies and businesses. And uh, I have the great pleasure to have you on my mic uh, today because I must say I'm a big fan of your podcast, The Marketing Book Podcast. And you will explain to us a little bit more about this podcast. But just so we know what we're going to talk about with you, Douglas, Um, we're going to explore the major trends and must know about marketing and sales altogether. So this is a big program. I hope that everybody listening to the podcast and to the video is going to listen to the end because you are very, um, you are an inspiration regarding these two mm. topics, Douglas. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So what can I say about your achievements? Maybe you can explain a little bit to us Europeans, what is the podcast that you run and that you created, the Marketing Book Podcast? Yes, it's uh, the Marketing Book Podcast. It's been named by LinkedIn as one of the podcasts that will make you a better marketer. And for the, the, the uh, podcast that will keep you in the know. Uh, so for the last five and a half years, since January of 2015, I, every Friday I publish an interview with the author of a new marketing or sales book. And uh, so the reason I started, I don't podcast for a living. <laughs> I run a, a, a marketing agency, but I do it because I really enjoy doing it. And this is something that's relevant for a lot of people in business. I came advertising background. So I worked at the really big ad agencies in New York City. And when I started my own company, it was very much advertising. And then about 10, at least 10 years ago, a little more, I noticed that advertising was changing dramatically, permanently. So uh, I like to joke that if advertising still worked well, uh, I would doing it. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I, I changed what we do for the um, my company. We work in of uh, content marketing and uh, things related to um, helping uh, sales teams. But uh, going through that process was uh, a little bit depressing for me because uh, I, I've started to feel like a dinosaur. I started to feel less and less relevant and it really bothered me and I saw how the world was changing and I didn't like feeling irrelevant. So I went back to reading a lot of books to try to figure out, to, to become more knowledgeable about where things were going because I had been very, very comfortable as a ad man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, uh, I would even, um, I had met some of these authors at conferences and I would even bring their books to the conference to get them to autograph it. So you might get autographed sports memorabilia. Uh, I get autographed marketing and sales books. <laughs> so and you're, so you're a true fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm a true fan of these. I'm like a sports writer who's excited that he gets to interview the, the, um, the star. And so I always listen to a lot of podcasts, particularly marketing podcasts, and I always enjoyed podcasts where the authors were, where our authors were interest, uh, interviewed. And so I finally decided to start a podcast where I was going to interview authors, and I looked and saw that marketingbookpodcast.com was available. <laughs> so I <laughs> took that as a sign from on high that maybe I should do this. And uh, I um, started interviewing these authors. And uh, after about 10 interviews, 
uh, and these were books that I had already read. Only then did I realize that I was going to need to read each book <laughs> before each interview. And so uh, last, uh, I think last week I published episode 290. Wow. And so I've read all those books and it's only one book a week and I, I get a lot out of it. I like learning and I also enjoy knowing that people like yourself, uh, people I get to meet are finding the podcast helpful. So I read the book and then I ask questions that I think would be uh, so that are surprising to me or that would be interesting to you, particularly people who um, are not as close uh, to marketing and sales as, as we are. There are a lot of marketing people. Mm -hmm. And I, I checked the other day, there's listeners in 158 countries okay. and a lot of marketers, but a lot of salespeople like yourself. <laughs> and it, it always surprises me. And uh, a lot of um, people that I, I jokingly call thrusters, meaning they were suddenly thrust into a marketing role, or maybe they were head of sales and they put marketing on their business card or someone who just became the CEO or a president is mm. and matters most in uh, marketing and sales. And so along the way, I think after about 60 interviews, I interviewed my first author of a sales book. And I think I get more marketing ideas from reading sales books than I do from <laughs> reading marketing books. And I've now interviewed, I've now had at least 40 books about sales and every okay. single one of them is really good. And um, I think that the more that marketers understand about sales, the more effective they are because it gets them closer to understanding how people buy. Mm. And uh, there are a lot of very successful salespeople that seem to be doing even better the more they understand uh, uh, about how marketing works because marketing and sales are having to work more closely together to be more effective because um, in the past, like you may have heard me say, when my father wanted to buy a new car, the first place he would have to go to get information was to the car dealership, the place that sold the car, because they had the information. There was really no internet, none of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then um, there was this asymmetry of information. Well, now my wife, uh, Flavia, do you know? Do you know the last place she went to get information when she bought a new car? <laughs> I think maybe it's the same place, right? Well, the last place she went was her husband, <laughs> <laughs> but the last place she went to was the dealership because yeah. she had so much other information out there, and that's the challenge that a lot of salespeople have is they're engaging with customers long after they have gotten information elsewhere. So mm -hmm. that's why sales and marketing, uh, companies that have faster growth and higher profitability, it's been shown that their sales and their marketing are better aligned. And uh, before we deep down uh, uh, into the marketing or sales tips that you can give us after almost 300 interviews that you've got with your podcast and a lot of- including including one author from France. <laughs> Great. I'm going to look at that. <laughs> he lives in Hawaii. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> that's not really the same, but okay. <laughs> no. no, but uh, I mean, for those who are not specialized, neither in sales or marketing, maybe you, you talked about them, a CEO, a founder, somebody who just created his own business and, and she or he wants to drive uh, bigger sales or results or awareness. Um, what kind of advice or tips do you have to give to them so that they can uh, drive uh, the growth of their company? Well, after reading all these hundreds of books, and I had read more before that as well, um, but I can prove that I've read 290. Um, the companies that do the best, the companies that are the most successful, even if they don't have the best product, are the ones that understand their customers better than their competition. And it's surprisingly difficult for companies to uh, focus on their customers. And then they all say they're customer focused, but they're not. They're more focused maybe on their operations. I mean, things that take up a lot of their time. And this is an observation, not a criticism. They're, they're very focused on running their businesses. 
that's fair. And then there's other companies that are, they'll never admit this, but they're very focused on their competition. Whatever their competition does, that tends to drive a lot of the strategic decisions that they make. And then there's a third group out of three companies that are just more, a little more focused on observing their customers and understanding their customers. And I'll give you an example of one and it's Amazon. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon has said that they're not that focused on, they focus on their competition Competition, but a lot less than they do on their customers. Hmm. They're obsessed with observing their customers and specifically finding friction. So the more friction that you can find in your customer's life, even if it's not something you can directly help with, the better you're going to understand your customers. And so Amazon is just an extreme example, like one click ordering that you may have heard of, they mm -hmm. patented that. And the only reason they did that is because they were trying to uh, make dealing with that, buying from them easier. And I, so I would say to a lot of uh, companies, what are you doing to make buying from you easier? Clearly. And, yeah. and Douglas, this is a great idea. And if you are a founder or manager, maybe you don't work alone. You have maybe a CMO or a chief sales officer, or I don't know. Uh, what kind of goals would you give them? Well, that's, there's a multifaceted answer there. Um, the, there. There's two things I would suggest as it relates to understanding your customer. There's something uh, related to understanding your customer. But first, I would urge any CMO to understand who is your most profitable customer. Mm. Um, what are your company's revenue goals? <laughs> what are your company's sales goals? You would know that, but mm -hmm. too many marketers never even bother to ask. Seriously? Um, really? Yeah. Have you seen... Uh, have you not seen that to be true? Yeah, yeah, I know that, of course, we are more focused on our own goals, but I think, yeah, I, I thought that maybe, maybe I'm naive that just the revenue or margin goals of the company would be shared globally in every department, you know? Well, there, let me put it this way. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> of all the authors I've interviewed who've written about sales books, too many of them talk about how marketing is uh, a lot of marketers. Okay, if, if someone's watching this and they know all that, good for you, you get a gold <laughs> star. But there are still too many uh, marketers who don't know what margin goals are, who don't know what the revenue goals, they don't know what the sales goals, they don't. They might not even know what the, uh, if there's a strategic plan or a business plan. <clears throat> and what I mean by that, and, and, and again, not to criticize the marketers because a lot of marketers are doing what they're told to do. But there is a widespread perception of marketers as what I sometimes call arts and crafts party planners who work in the make it pretty department. And what I mean by that is they are, they don't seem to have any connection to revenue. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to have any, how are what they doing connected to sales pipeline? Okay. Just answer that question. So okay. any marketing person, and I think one of the, there's an entire book called The Customer Centricity Playbook uh, by Peter Fader, who was, is with the University of Pennsylvania. And it talks about how, in truth, all your marketing should be based on going after your most profitable customers. Too many companies are treating all their customers the same, mm. and they're not even identifying what are the most, what are the more profitable customers to allocate our marketing toward? Mm -hmm. So that would, that would be one right. thing right there. And uh, sometimes when I give talks about what I've learned through all these hundreds of books, that's the very first one is marketers have an image problem. Okay. Okay. So um, fortunately we're on an electronic conversation, so I can't be thrown off the stage <laughs> um, because sometimes I'll say that to marketers and, um, they either really like it and they're doing that or they're very troubled, but they're not going to work in marketing much longer if they don't 
if they don't have a business first mindset. Okay. Uh, you know what, Douglas, uh, rejoice because uh, the conversation continues after the podcast or the video with our community, our business community. So, of course, I'm going to uh, ask the, the listeners to connect with you on LinkedIn if they have further questions and we can yes. continue the conversation. So feel free um, to ask Douglas your question or maybe to react also to what you just said about marketing. If you are a marketer, I don't know, but it's interesting to, to have some debate about the topics that we And I have discuss. a presentation with slides in the script of some of these things too, which talk about very specific books, which I'm happy to share with anyone. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that marketers and businesses should be doing is, well, let me get, let me tell you a, a real quick story. There was a listener to the Marketing Book Podcast who was a marketer, and she said she got promoted because of something she learned on the Marketing Book Podcast. <laughs> now, most of the listeners to the podcast, I, I'm rather impressed. They're they're very sharp people. They they're they're they tend to be rather successful, and they want to be even more successful. So I think she could have done this without me. But there was some book, and I can't remember which one because they start to blur together. There's been 300 books and just as many cocktails, <clears throat> and um, there was a, an exercise she did and she was saying to her company, to her CEO was there. She says, we just don't understand enough about our customers. Mm -hmm. And so she, what she did is she said, everyone here, uh, think of a television show uh, that you like and think of a specific character on the TV show and on this piece of paper, write down everything you know about them, everything you know about them. And almost everyone has a, maybe a TV or a, a series on Netflix yeah. or something. Um, and uh, so everyone had fun and they wrote down what they knew about a particular character. Mm -hmm. And then she said, okay, now that you've filled that page up, turn the page over and write down everything you know about our ideal customer. Wow. <laughs> And they all said, oh, gosh, gosh. I nice. don't know. I don't know. Here's how you get around that is first look at the financials, figure out who your best customer is. If it's anyone with a pulse, that's that's not good. You, The more that you can figure out who your ideal customer is, the easier it is for someone like you in sales mm. To go after the right kind of customers and actually in the marketing business if we know a company has a specific goal as to who they really what is the ideal fish they want to catch mm. it makes the marketing that much more effective because we're able to uh, direct it and uh, the book buyer personas is excellent and and even if you don't buy her book if you go to buyerpersona.com you can read about these five rings of insight and if you mm. just understand these five insights about your customers, and this works really well for salespeople too, mm. you will have a much deeper understanding of what your customers' problems are, what the friction is in their life, and uh, you will really stand out. And as I, as I sometimes say, it almost gives you an unfair advantage. <laughs> and when and we've, done, we've done these interviews for clients, don't let your salespeople do it because they're busy and they want they have other skills if you could actually find someone mm. outside to do it it's it's better the the conversation ends up being rarely about the client's product or service it's more about what are the real challenges that they have and almost every time a client is able to say oh we could help with that you know we 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 understand that we know how to talk about that you become, uh, you start to break through to your to your and customers, whether it's in sales or marketing. I think this is really uh, interesting because this is some something that maybe people know about uh, design thinking approaches or agile mm -hmm. management methods. So maybe people who are in operation, in innovation, uh, can help with that because knowing the the buyer's persona will help for many many things in the company and not just sales or marketing. I think. Oh, you're absolutely right, mm -hmm. and. Um, this approach helping much more than just marketing. It helps with products or services that you start to offer. And do you know when you are on the right track, when, when the people at your company start referring to that person by name, it's a fictional mm -hmm. name, but it could be, um, you know, uh, 
like we had one uh, recently for a, a, co a company that built out all these interior spaces for large companies, and they dealt with what's called in the United States a facilities manager. Mm -hmm. And they called him facilities manager Tony. And we even have a picture of him up in the, it's, it's, it was a stock photo, but it's facilities manager, Tony. And they say, that's who it, that's who it is. That's who we deal with. And the way that you know you're successful is in conversations within your company, people start to say, wait a minute, that's facilities manager, Tony. He would not care about that. That's how like you know it. you're successful. Like yeah. It. And you know, I like to, to give some challenges as well for the people who listen or, or uh, watching this video. So um, last lately also, I was asking who is our most uh, uh, favorite customer and, and blah, blah, blah. And then I, we just met with some of the customers and went to the restaurant because we know in France, we love to go for our food. <laughs> so we went to dinner with some real customers. I mean, it was crazy. We discussed Good for you. personal life. Most companies and, don't even do that. Yeah. So I suggest that maybe um, if some of you uh, want to challenge yourself, you can just go uh, for having a lunch or a dinner or just a cocktail. And you can ask Douglas for some recipes of cocktails because I know you did many, <laughs> many cocktail hours uh, during quarantine with your hustle. <laughs> That's right. It, when the quarantine happened, um, you could say I turned to alcohol, but not really. But <laughs> I, I, started to sup, I started to add additional episodes with past guests, not to talk about their books, but to talk about the implications of this quarantine. And in almost all cases, uh, both of us were drinking. So we would do the interviews later in the day um, <laughs> because I don't drink all day. And uh, we did 66 and finally I had to stop because my liver needed a break. <laughs> <laughs> but that was called authors in quarantine getting cocktails. <laughs> and uh, uh, just to finish with the, the, the part of uh, your expertise, because we all want to know what's inside the, the books that you've read. And so um, I want to ask you, Douglas, what kind of use, useful tips or maybe uh, trends uh, you learned by speaking with, with these uh, sales and marketing authors lately? Hmm. Not easy to choose, I know. I, I don't want I you to get mad with some of your interviewees, so we're going to put lots of links, of course, also in the audio description. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, um, the as I said before, the more that you are, the, the more that you understand your customers, the better. Um, marketing, uh, the, the era of easy marketing and sales is over. The problem is that, and, and it's much more challenging to be a salesperson now. And maybe there'll be a few, there'll be some fewer salespeople in the future, but those that are in sales are going to be very, very successful because what they're, if you're an order taker, you're not going to be in sales much longer. Mm. But people in the future who are in sales, I think are going to be even more successful and, and more admired. At the same time, marketing has become much more complicated. Mm. And uh, marketing uh, used to be um, a little easier to understand. And the problem with uh, the widespread perception of marketing, for particularly for people who came up in a time when there was a captive audience that you could shout at and advertise, and trust me, as an ad man, it worked well. It doesn't anymore, but like TV, you mean? Yeah, TV advertising, and, and uh, so what, what people think of as marketing is uh, just promotion. Mm. When, when in truth, marketing is sometimes is referred to as there's four P's, and that's your product. What are you doing to your people? Think, oh, we haven't done any marketing. You've been doing marketing every single day because marketing involves your product what product you're offering, what changes to your product, how you price it and how your customers pay for it. There's a lot of innovation there and how you distribute place, how you distribute it. Are you distributing it through channels? Are you selling it online? All those are the first three P's of marketing, product, place, product, uh, price, place. The fourth P is promotion. You shouldn't mm -hmm. even do promotion. <laughs> 
until you have those first three optimized. And that surprises a lot of people. Mm. So I think there's a, but there's a, a perception of marketing is simply getting our name out there. Yeah. When in fact, uh, the greatest marketers are the ones that are the experts on their customers. Mm, great. So um, we're going to look for all your recommendations and books and everything. But I, I want to ask you something, Douglas, and it's more like a personal because you are those, a business. Those charges were dropped. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, I have no, no criminal past. <laughs> no problem. So, I mean, you are a business owner and leader because you run, you run your uh, marketing agency, which by the way is called Artillery, Says Artillery. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. That's right. I was in our, and in my youth, I was an artillery lieutenant uh, in Germany for three years. <laughs> and I know you work for a German company, so, <laughs> so I got to go to France a lot. That's true. So you, you run this company and uh, also you are uh, a podcast host. And you read these books every week. So just how do you do? <laughs> how do you manage to 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 achieve these uh, many activities? <laughs> With scotch. No, um, in fact, reading all these books has cut into my scotch drinking, which is why there's still scotch here. Um, well, the, the it's something I enjoy doing. And it's really a priority. So when someone says, how do you find time to do that? Well, it's really just kind of what your priorities are. So some people like watching television, some people like, uh, you know, have different hobbies. And uh, so I read the book on the weekend, mm -hmm. maybe two hours on Saturday and Sunday and, and finish up during the week when I have uh, a little bit of time. And then I just do the interview during the, the so it's, it's a priority, but I mean, I, I also exercise three times a week. So that's at least three hours right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, so it's just something that it's kind of worked its way into my routine, you know, and now that I'm giving up the lease on our office because no one wants to come into the office anymore, I'm here at, at home. And uh, <laughs> so there's no commute time. Uh, so that's, that's how I, uh, that's how I do it is I guess the, the, the short answer is I made it a, a priority and it's something I want to do. Um, so it's not a, it's not a burden. Okay, great. And and that keeps you up to date as well. And it's very important in, in the world we are living in. So yeah. And um, I get to meet people like you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's nice indeed. And uh, I wanted to explain also a little bit about our uh, meeting because actually I was just a fan of your podcast and I was sharing this on LinkedIn. But I wasn't even quoting you because I, I don't know, you were not uh, uh, part of my uh, network on LinkedIn. And you, 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 I don't know how you managed to see my post. It was in French, but you just replied and sent me some uh, small gifts uh, by post, like stickers yeah. for my computer and stuff. You know, I was amazed. This is coming next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Douglas is so considerate to think of his fan like that. And, uh, and then I just dared uh, to ask you uh, on LinkedIn if you wanted to come to, to the podcast and to have a chat with me. And so I, I think that's the magic as well of the, the network we are uh, uh, evolving in and uh, I like the idea of the connections that you make through the podcast. Oh, me too. It's so uh, interesting and um, I like to say that I also have the most attractive audience in uh, <laughs> all of podcast world. I mean, look look who I'm talking to right now. Um, I'm glad to know that that arrived and if there's any people watching or listening uh, and I can send you some uh, marketing book podcast, yes. uh, laptop stickers and book please let me know. Um, well, it's just, uh, I think the reason I saw that LinkedIn post is because someone else mentioned my name. They tagged me. It might've been Olivia. Mm, yeah, that's true. And uh, that's how I saw it. And I thought, oh my goodness. Um, I, I really appreciate you. I was so excited to know that uh, someone gets value from it. And if I wanted to ever stop the podcast, I don't think I could because um, and I blame people like you because these people say, hey, that was a great interview. Thank you. I found it really helpful. Or like that other uh, woman here in the United States who got said she got promoted. It's like, oh, no, I can't stop now. I, I, I don't want to disappoint people. So that, that's why I, I continue to do it is because people seem to enjoy it. And 
The other thing that you should know uh, is that about 10 years ago, in lieu of a midlife crisis, I started performing stand-up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm all better now. Thank you. <laughs> but And I had to stop the stand-up comedy because it was, it was the performing was very late at night and I had a job. And, um, but I think that I am still able to channel some of that into uh, my podcast. And I know I was ex ex successful because your friend, our friend Olivier, he said, I really get your sense of humor. And I just thought, my goodness, <laughs> that's, that's more than my wife can say. And uh, <laughs> so... No, but I must say your podcast is also very entertaining. It's not just for uh, sales nerds, you know. It's it, You always get something very interesting about life we are living in and business. And, and also the authors that you interview, they are also sometimes businessmen themselves or businesswomen. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to, to get to know them. And uh, one, one quick thing again about the podcast. So when... What kind of advice would you have to people like me or like uh, some of our listeners who want to go live with their passion or hobby or expertise and maybe create a podcast or create a channel or uh, create a media about their expertise? Um, I would mention one thing. Um, most podcasts never get to episode eight. Because a lot of people, I mean, how many people have said signed up for a marathon and then didn't run in the marathon? So it's something you have to decide, who, why am I doing this? Um, is it something I enjoy doing or is it going to feed my business? The other thing, um, it's like a lot, most, I think corporate blogs don't have more than five blog posts because <laughs> they, yeah. they start it and then they kind of don't realize that it takes a little bit more time. But I think the best advice for your, anyone who's looking to build an audience is think hard about who that audience is. Kind of like back to what I was saying, like who's your ideal customer? Not everyone, but who's the one you really want because there are riches in niches. And uh, uh, so I think that if you can figure out who it is that you're trying to reach and then maybe niche further down, and I know you would probably say niche, but niche <laughs> further down. Um, niche for us, it's more like a philosopher. <laughs> oh, Nietzsche? Yes. <laughs> I see. Um, well, that's my, my American uh, pronunciation of fr French words. <laughs> of which there are many in the English language. But I think, think hard about who it is you're trying to reach and what, what you want to do for them. That, that's something that too many people think, I wanna be all things to all people. It's no different from a business that says, we, we want to be all things to all people. Actually, the most successful ones are the ones who are able to say no to grow. In other words, they're able to say, this is, this is who we don't wanna work with. This is who we're not trying to attract. Mm, clearly. Well, great advice. And in terms of advice, we, we see a lot today on the internet or in the podcast or everything. Can you remember the best advice you were given and maybe the worst? Um, the best advice came from a friend of mine who named uh, Brad McDonald, and he was a US, Arm, a U.S. Navy submarine commander at one time, but he, 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 worked, he worked in sales after he got out, and he uh, wrote a book uh, called The Psychology of, of Sales. It was very interesting, and I remember um, he said, you know, there were like three rules for success, and I hope I can remember them. One <laughs> is take responsibility for yourself, and what he meant by that was don't there are external things that you can't control. Focus on what you, you can control. For instance, in sales, don't worry so much about the outcome. Focus on the things that you can control. The results will come. And uh, the second one was um, do what you say you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a um, that is such a great example and I, I, I do what you say you're going to do. So it doesn't mean make a lot of promises, but if you mm. do, everyone's watching to see if you're going to do them. Yeah. If you say you're going to call someone tomorrow and you don't, 
Mm. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And the third one was, and this is probably my favorite, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. <laughs> so in other words, if you are, um, let's say a sales manager and you want more sales, well, you're not going to get more sales unless you are maybe doing pipeline reviews <laughs> or, mm. or, you know, watching the activity. Mm. Um, like my, my brothers and I own a house on the beach in Florida and, uh, a company runs it and uh it's a good a good example where when we start checking things uh they know that that's what we're going to check and mm. those things are always addressed <laughs> but if we don't uh, if we don't they, they go with they, they, they people we're all the same we're going to do what what's being inspected for so mm. i think those were three um, those were, so you got a bonus there, Bobby. Oh, you yeah. asked for one, you got three. Yeah. I'm over delivering. <laughs> is so, it at the hour yet in the, in, in the US? No, well, it's, it's five o'clock somewhere. Um, <laughs> no, it's not actually. I'm on the East Coast and it's only 10, which is why I was drinking coffee. But uh, it's happy hour. Well, it's happy hour in uh, maybe one time zone past you. So it's <laughs> there's five o'clock somewhere. Um, so I don't know about the worst advice. Um, uh, maybe I don't, I can't recall the worst advice I've ever gotten because um, it's my way of, of uh, coping and blacking out <laughs> <laughs> bad things. But there's lots of, there's lots of uh, bad, bad advice. I, I, I don't know. I guess when it comes to advice, you have to, um, be skeptical. Like, for instance, when I had a boat, when you notice, when you say, hey, what kind of boats, you know, you, you start asking people what kind of boat you should get, everyone recommends the boat they have. <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, the motorcycle that I have. <laughs> people ask advice, they recommend exactly what they have. Or like if a hunting equipment. They mm -hmm. recommend the rifle that they have. So it's like uh, you, you have to be careful about um, you have to be careful advice. So I'm sorry, I can't I can't think of something. Um, no, but that's, that's no problem. And that's also why we listen to podcasts or see videos or read articles. It's also to make up uh, our own minds uh, about things and uh, yeah, pick up what we need as uh, the good tips for us at a certain moment. So that's perfect. And to finish with this interview, Douglas, so I have two questions for you. First, when will you write a book yourself? I'm not sure I will. I'm too busy reading them. Um, <laughs> but I think that uh, it's my sense that you know you're a writer when you're tormented by something until you get it into a book. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I would write about. It needs to be something that would <clears throat> just torture me until I, I'm able to get the book out there. Okay. Um, but so if you have any ideas, please let yeah. me know. Okay. We let, we let you know Douglas and with all the listeners as well. And uh, the last one is uh, what's your last uh, piece of advice for our listeners and, uh, and leaders uh, about your uh, expertise or, or else? about business? Well, if you listen to the Marketing Book Podcast, all your dreams will come true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that um, the more that you can, uh, here, here's, here's my last bit of advice that we didn't talk about. And that is, again, back to understanding your customer and finding friction Take your customer's point of view as it relates to buying from you, like a mystery shopper. You, how difficult are you making it to do business with you? You have to have a certain amount of empathy and humility to, to get that information. And usually it's the CEO that decides that they want to engineer a better experience for their customers. Mm -hmm. And the experience that your customers have with you is the most powerful marketing you have. Mm -hmm. It's not running ads. It's once they are interacting with you and become a customer, 
they can then tell so many other people and they come back and they're willing to pay more. So the most important marketing, the most power marketing you have is the way you make your customers feel in doing business with you. Okay, great. So we're going to finish the, the interview on this uh, this advice. And of course, uh, I recommend that you listen to uh, the Marketing Book Podcast and we, we will put the link in the description. And uh, also, thank you, can I last... interrupt? Um, yes. if, if there are any listeners or, or viewers who um, where I can recommend a specific book or a resource uh, for whatever problem you find yourself in, please let me save you some time. <laughs> I don't want you to have to read 290 books to find the right one. There might be one that would be very effective. Connect with me on LinkedIn and we can chat there. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much, Douglas, uh, for being with us today. And uh, so uh, we give you a, a virtual hug and uh, maybe we have you uh, in the next episode. I don't know if you want to practice your French, you can still listen to the further episodes of Le Board. <laughs> yes, well, Thank I can you. share it. I can certainly share yeah. it. And my wife and daughter will be very impressed that I, <laughs> that I was uh, interviewed here. Merci beaucoup, Douglas. Au revoir.